So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Bailendorf. I want to call the uh, August 26th meeting of U46 school, uh, school Board to order. Again, I'm Jack Bailendorf, chairman of the U46 School Board. And actually, we'll start on my far right, Bob, and we'll work our way around clockwise and introduce ourselves. Technology Essex. Aaron Knox, school board member from Essex Junction. Alvin Barnier, school board member. Hey, Terry Baker, school board member, town of Essex. Uh, Jack Bailendorf uh, from Essex Junction. Judith Genoa, superintendent. Brian Dunny, school board member from Essex Junction. Robert, principal of Essex High School. Brian McLaren, uh, school, board, school board member from Essex Town. We start our meetings with the, uh, uh, I'll read the mission statements for both Essex High School and uh, uh, Center for Technology Essex. Essex High School is a mission-driven and learning-centered community that believes through both independent and collaborative engagement, everyone can develop excellence in their individual pursuits. We offer a rigorous and varied curriculum and believe in challenging students to think critically and act responsibly, compassionately, and respectfully. We foster intellectual curiosity and resourcefulness so that students can engage in their learning to achieve the behaviors, skills, and knowledge essential to become contributing members of their community and citizens of a diverse and ever-changing world. The Center for Technology Essex provides comprehensive technical programs for all students which include career exploration, preparation, and technical literacy in a respectful learning environment. Students will have the opportunity to acquire skills necessary to reach their individual goals. Thank you. Our, our agenda has, uh, before I go into the uh, uh, visitors and staff to be heard this evening, I just want to uh, reintroduce everyone here. This is uh, uh, Superintendent Judith DeNova's first meeting with us in her new job uh, coming up this year, and we look forward to a productive year and uh, it's, it's, it's always a new time, you know, this time of school year, we're invigorated and engaged, ready to be engaged in all things school related again, and it's, uh, as, we, as we finish up with the summer, it's nice to be back at school and working with you and your team on, uh, on, on the, uh, the challenges that face all of us. Thank you, Jack. Okay, thank you. So, visitors to be heard. We have visitors this evening. Uh, is there... Please step forward to the microphone and introduce yourselves, and uh, uh, we look forward to, to hearing Hi. your thoughts. Hi. My name is Tammy Charbonneau, and first of all, thank you for serving on the board. Um, I know what a thankless job that it certainly can be, and as an educator in Burlington, um, I know the time and energy you put in, so thank you. Um, I'm here as um, a resident. Who, my family has owned property here in Essex Junction for almost 50 years, and you look out the window, you can probably, when the trees, leaves aren't on the trees, you can see the commune that we have across the brook. Um, and it's that property that I actually want to talk to you about tonight. Um, because one of the things that we've done in the last, I don't know, three or four or five years, is we've started leasing the property out front or allowing the motorcycle classes to use this property. Which, first and foremost, let me say that I am a proponent of, my, of motor, motorcycle safety. I'm a motorcyclist myself, so it's not the class that I have an issue with. I have an issue with um, its location to my property. Um, the classes are offered on weekends. This summer, it seems like they were offered every weekend in June and every weekend in July, which means our property really isn't a nice, comfortable place to live. Um, what I did was I took the opportunity to snap some pictures of the property we're talking about. You can kind of pass this around if you'd like. Um, I have talked to Bruce Murdo before, and um, Judy and I have done correspondence, and this is the place she said I should come, so this is where I am. One of the things that was asked of me was, why don't your neighbors complain, which is hence why I took the pictures. Our property on North Street is the only house that I know of that has taken full opportunity to develop its land into what I call a nice, communal, quiet place to be right here in, in the middle of town. When the high school was built many, many years ago, my family took into account the fact that we were moving, or the high school was moving to our backyard. 
And if you look at the pictures, you'll see that there's been shrubberies and trees put in, and the pool fence is a far don't um, far distance away from the the um, fence and the the brook line. That's all done so that we can live peacefully and always have with what's happening up here in the high school. Unfortunately, the motorcycles are like living next to a go kart race. Worse than that. My partner's here tonight because what she said she was going to do is to keep sitting here throughout the meeting, keep yelling, Walter, Walter, Walter. Um, because there was this one Saturday and Sunday class where Walter was not doing a very good job. What? Vinny. Oh, Vinny. I'm sorry, Vinny. Vinny was not doing a very good job, so the motorcycle instructors um, yell to Vinny all afternoon. And it's not just all afternoon, it's two complete days. One of the arrangements we thought we had made was that the motorcycle classes not start before 10 o'clock on Sunday or 9 o'clock on Sunday. Well, the classes don't technically start before 9 o'clock, but the motorcyclists come to practice at 7 o'clock every day. It was held this year on um, Memorial Day weekend. So we moved a barbecue from our house because it's just like, it really seriously is listening um, to gnats and sitting next to a go-kart race all weekend long. We take full account of the activities that happen here in Essex and we know that coming up on Monday is the Labor Day tractor pulls. Knowing that, we know that we're not gonna be at our house here for exactly the same reason. So we're fully aware of you know, where we live and um, what's surrounding us, but <coughs> some of the, the questions I've asked is we have quite a big parking lot can it be moved over there? Can it go behind the building? Lawton's available. I don't know of anybody that that would bother over there. The fairgrounds over there. Um, basically, I was kind of asked to do the legwork to try and figure out where they could go, and I'm really not interested in doing that. Um, I know that it's property that they they must pay money for to use, um, and there's just got to be another place they can go. Um, one of the things that I was told is that because of the requirements of the class, all of the, this is the only parking lot that could be used based on what they needed to be able to teach the class. Well, then maybe they need to reevaluate the class. Um, that's a really big parking lot. They used to do it at Fannie Allen. Fannie Allen certainly isn't that big. Um, and they utilize the whole thing. And they come in on Harleys. Some of them have, are taking this class in Harleys. That's just, really, really bad. Um, so my request is that we find another place to put them. Um, why is no one else complaining? I don't really know that that's a relevant question, but it was asked, so the pictures tell you that we, we have made our backyard a sanctuary. And you can't spend a lot of time in your summer sanctuary in Vermont. And we haven't been able to do it for many, many weekends. We'd invite you over for a barbecue if you like, so you can kind of see what it's like to do all weekend. Um, but we're asking your help in trying to figure this out. Um, I, I don't have any other solutions. This is the third year that um, I've, I've been dealing with this or asking questions through nobody's fault. The first year um, I was talking with Bruce, and I'm not throwing anybody on the bu under any buses. Um, Bruce and I chatted about it a lot and then other more important things in life come up. My dad passed away. That was not as important. I mean, you know, the motorcycles take second. My partner had cancer last summer. That takes second precedence. Well, here we are in year three um, and we couldn't enjoy our backyard again. So, help. Did you know that you guys have authority over that? <laughs> Yes, Tammy, thank you. Do we have any questions? Quickly? Go ahead. How many motorcycles are there in this class? It varies. There's at least six. Sometimes there's up to 12 or 15. Um, there's not usually less than six. And uh, for the administration, uh, I guess we authorized the usage of but is this a volunteer group? Is it a school sponsored event? What's the story? Um, it's not a school sponsored event. So it extends beyond um, the school community's needs. So we do have authority over where they conduct the class. 
Okay. Is that the Motorcycle Safety Foundation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good class. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's a really good class. It's not, it's a private company. Right. Yep. They're required to run, it's, they're required to follow the Motorcycle Safety Foundation guidelines to be able, but it's not the Motorcycle Safety Foundation. They run their course. Mm -hmm. This is a long conversation that I have actually been meeting to bring up, so I mean, I don't, I don't need to ask a bunch mm -hmm. of questions. Because it's the only private motorcycle core company that's giving courses in the whole state, and it's just, they basically got grandfathered in. Because mm -hmm. now all the courses are run through the DMV, which is why I know this. Oh, not true. So, um, <laughs> yeah. That's but, actually true. Okay, my research so, yeah. we can schedule it for yes. So, 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 just to level set where everyone are, the public to be heard is we, an issue has been raised. It's not really a time for discussion of this matter. Uh, I appreciate you coming in and taking your time this Thanks. evening and, and making the board aware of this issue that's of concern to you. And and um, it's time for this board to. We've got our agenda, we'll move on, but it's a topic for us to, to consider in our deliberations, and we will keep you informed, Tammy, through administration as to how this issue is progressing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Next, uh, our principal's reports. Um, both our principals are, are here this evening. Uh, Mr. Bob Travers from CPE and Mr. Rob Reardon from EHS. And uh, gentlemen, I'm glad you're here. And I just, again, like I said to our superintendent, it's nice to be here at the beginning of the year. There's always renewed enthusiasm uh, to be in school. And uh, we're anxious to and, and look forward to working with you and your teams on, uh, on the challenges that we'll face this year. So, okay. Bob, we'll start off with you. Okay. Um, yeah, lots of energy. A lot of work's been going on uh, at the school, in the building, all summer long. I, I want to say, um, uh, I haven't seen the building look this good in a while. It always looks good, but it seems like the maintenance staff really worked pretty hard to, to, to get it to where it is right now. So um, we're very appreciative of all their work and just wanted to say that in front of the board. Um, following my report, under the area of safe and healthy, Safe, healthy, and respectful learning environments. There's a few things I wanted to point out. Um, this is the second year that we've been working on our faculty advisory groups. At the end of last year, the faculty advisory groups had uh, formed, uh, completed the creation of their um, action plans, and committed to launching those action plans uh, this entire year. Uh, during the summer, uh, we actually had a very effective and, and, and uh, informative um, training for uh, volunteer advisory group facilitators. All of the advisory groups are going to be facilitated by faculty or staff. Um, we did that training with Mary Jane Shelley and Carolyn Dickinson. It focuses on appreciative inquiry facilitation skills. Um, just last week on August 22nd, we committed one of uh, one full day of our in-service days to have each of the facilitators of the advisory groups work their, work their groups through um, planning their launch activities. Each one of the seven groups has a launch activity and they're all focused on initiatives and tied to the action plan of the school. Um, and then today, as another full day of in-service, we had 20 new CTE faculty members start a three-credit appreciative inquiry course with Mary Jane Shelley. That also included some members from uh, other schools in the district. It was nice to have people from outside sitting in on the class. Um, so more to come on the success of the faculty advisory groups this year. Under student achievement, a um, couple of points I'd like to point out. The CTE pre-tech program is undergoing a program self-study this year. We're using a model that comes out of the Agency of Education in Missouri. The goal is to, to evaluate the um, integrated academic instruction so that they can identify a viable curriculum 
and make adjustments to their master calendar. Um, if, the, if the study is successful, we're, we're considering using it for all programs in the tech center. Skills USA, I know you probably saw the emails, but I just want to highlight it again. 18 students competed on, in the national competition in Kansas City this past July. Of those 18 students, five of the competitors scored in the top 10, and two of the competitors scored in the top 20. Uh, especially notable was we won a gold medal, mm -hmm. um, which means that one of our students was the best in the nation in the category that she competed in. That was Clover Burt. She's a, a dental assisting student and she was competing in customer service. We had a 18th place in cosmetology, a 14th place in pin design, a, a um, sixth place in 3D animation, a sixth place in customer service. We also had a fifth place in um, web design and a fifth place in dental assisting. So that's that's immediate feedback on the quality of the students and the, and the success of the instruction that we have at the center. If you remember, they do a regional competition in the state of Vermont. If they win that competition, they go to Kansas City. Um, 18 was the largest group we sent in, in a long time. Another, uh, another feather in the cap for instructors and students is the Building Technology Residential Program uh, sold its project house that they've been working on for two years. Uh, typo, it's not 17 Taft Street, that's the one we saw two years ago, it was 16 Taft Street. Um, it was on the market for two days, it sold for full asking price. I sat back and calculated, it was over 40 students who worked on that house for over 2,000 lab hours. Um, instructors, one instructor committed 3,700 instructional hours in the building. Um, and to give you a sense of our cycle, uh, a week after we sold the house, we're, we were going for approval on permits for the next house because we only built these houses so that we can provide excellent instruction for the students. So we are in the process of pulling ta uh, permits for 19 Taft Street and we will build that house over the next two years. Well, yes? What, what did you work with to get the access? Was it a local realtor? Or well, that's, that's a great point. I'm glad you asked because uh, we went with Lang. Um, and they very graciously, after we spoke with them, reduced the, the percentage on the sale because we're a not-for-profit. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the uh, first time we've, we've had that experience in a while. We'll certainly work with them again. We considered selling it ourselves, um, but in the end, the turnaround is just too quick from having to get the house sold while um, Moving forward on the on the design and construction plans for the next house, I didn't. We didn't have time to do it. Yeah. Um, so um, it it was uh, it was Lane and it was Karen Golden, the, the person who helped sell the house. So. So it was with their consultation that the three eighty nine five. That's right. We did a number of studies. We actually had a we had a tour group come in from Lang of other realtors who were who were selling houses in other markets and this market. They discussed the features of the house. We went through a two-step phase because the house wasn't finished at first. We listed it for considerably less, and when the house was finished, we went back and uh, did, did a change contract and, and, and listed it for the amount that um, uh, more than five realtors agreed to. Uh, one saying slightly higher, a number were saying slightly lower, the median felt right. On that first two days, we actually had two offers. So. For public events over the next month, open house on September 19th, 6.30 to 8.30. Uh, I know we'll see a lot of the board members there. Um, communications, we are launching a quarterly newsletter this year. First one will be published on September 20th. It will be digital, mostly. We'll be sending it home through an email blast, but we'll also be featuring it on our website. Um, <coughs> Superintendent Denova is coming in to a joint faculty meeting in September to talk about calendar 2.0. Uh, something I'd like the board to know. Matt Gonzalez, uh, you know the name, is a CTE graduate. He worked in uh, computer animation web design. He was recently hired as a full-time staff member after the board approved the, the hire. 
um, immediately we felt the benefits of having Matt on staff full time. He is uh, very service oriented. He works hard, and he's a he's a clever person. Uh, he, he's doing some good work for the district. So I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of CTV for making his skills available to us. Good. Thank you, Bob. Do we have any questions for Bob on his uh, director's report? Is it possible to board members on your newsletter distribution? Yes. Yes. That newsletter is actually going to be part of the curriculum. Computer animation, web design, and graphic design are, are designing the, the, the elements of the, of, the, of the pages. Okay. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank you. So in the report, it said the reaccreditation letter was attached. And as I was reviewing it, it wasn't. So now I will give you a hard copy. Basically, to make a long story short, as you can read through it, there are deliverable dates, as there typically are with NEAS uh, visits and reports where we have to respond to the um, you know, recommendations. So that's all included in there. We are reaccredited. The, I'd say that the one thing to note are the many commendations that are listed there. You'll see uh, the recent initiatives that have been started within the last three years, three to four years. A lot of those are highlighted. So I felt very good about that as we're continuing to improve. In terms of the um, attendance task team report, I think besides, which, which is included, is you know the, the difference in terms of unexcused and cuts is an overall decrease between two years ago and last year of 59%. So I think that speaks volumes of tightening it up for every aspect, student, parent, teacher, administrator, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's, the, the process was um, thoroughly analyzed and I think one of, the, one of the highlights was being able to access the um, attendance taking by block to our email system where a student is, was marked absent, within a half hour, the parent would be getting an email. So that does a couple of things. Kind of puts pressure on the student. Also makes sure that we're taking accurate attendance at the beginning of each class. And if a person is showing up on excuse or cut from the administrator's perspective, they need to follow up in a timely manner within, within 48 hours. So, we saw a good movement there in terms of uh, students being where they needed to be. Did that result in additional interactions with parents as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. Bless you. Yeah, and, and it's um, as you can imagine, it's it's um, appreciated communication. I yes. guess as a, as an overall statement. As a matter of fact, it got <clears throat> got to a point. Some some parents were appreciative, but. Uh, some are getting annoyed towards the end of the school year. They're getting so many emails, and that was perhaps a family conversation that was going on. In terms of the uh, advisory, we this is a student advisory. Um, I thought I would share with you because this is one of the big NEASC uh, recommendations in terms of best practices moving forward. This packet, <coughs> which we will be receiving soon. Is a statement of purpose and goals, and I guess what I would just ask the board to flip to is the back of page two, which says advisory plan and activities year one at a glance. And basically, we're looking at quarter one, we are Essex High School. Critical question, what does it mean to be a member of the EHS community? Quarter two, making your way. Question, how can we use challenges to provide opportunities? Quarter three, embracing diversity. How does diversity enrich our lives? Quarter four, discovery. How does looking back push us forward? As a reminder, based on our student focus forum in February, the students, in terms of a proposed advisory at the time, 
said they felt meeting once a week was critical and also having the composition of the group be mixed grades. So the advisory I have has 12 students and there are three per grade. We're meeting Wednesdays for a half hour every Wednesday. And there is a toolkit which has been compiled. And I'd like to give special mention to um, learning community leaders Karen Zadowski and Jen McKenzie who have put a lot of time in this summer uh, to make sure that there are plenty of uh, items in the toolkit for teachers to access as we start with this new uh, advisory opportunity as a way to get to, for the students to have another adult besides a school counselor to be an advocate for them during their four-year experience here. And the rest of the packet is more informational uh, in nature, but I wanted you to be aware of how it's been specifically uh, designed for this school year. In terms of other parts um, of the report, a couple things. Um, the summer math class, which we did not run this year, I think it's something that as we, for the reasons I've listed in the, in the report, I think as we move towards a conversation on calendar 2.0 um, with one of the main items in terms of a proponent for a calendar like calendar 2.0 is to minimize the time off for students to minimize regression of learning and we have we have pretty good communication mechanisms in terms of Essex Town and obviously uh, ADL in terms of identifying kids but we use multiple measures so it's not simply it's not simply a, a, a kneecap test, it's, it's that in addition to their performance at the local school level. And sometimes, in many times, uh, the teachers and the principal will make the call that summer session may be in the student's best interest well after vacation plans have been made and recreation opportunities have signed up for and there's an inherent conflict of that in last Last year was a good example in the sense that the return on investment of the instruction with the students and their attendance and their ability to access the information was really not that good in terms of the time. If you recall, it was uh, four Monday through Thursday um, for six weeks, going from 9 to 11.30. And uh, the attendance was, like I said, we were having students miss because of realistic conflicts from a family perspective, missing two and three weeks of the six weeks. So it's it's very challenging to experience that. It's also very challenging to be the instructor in that situation. So that may be a a conversation point of Cal 2.0. In terms of the um, August second tour that I gave the class of 1973. You may have seen the nice article they had in the uh, Essex Reporter shortly after that. And there were about a dozen folks that showed up for the tour. And we started out at about 3 o'clock, a little after 3.10, and we finished at 4.30. And there was such genuine enthusiasm for some to be back the first time since they graduated. Two of the gentlemen were here, said they had driven by campus a couple of times since they graduated, and they were wondering what this space was, stuck on at the end of the building, which of course, this wasn't here in 73. So I think it was a wonderful opportunity to connect with, with graduates. It also brought back the point that some board members may recall when Jeff Culkin was chair, and that is the alumni outreach. I mean, I, I still think that that is just an untapped source of community pride, connection, and revenue. And uh, I, I just, this is a good time to talk about it in August, low key, but I think that's, that's an opportunity that we could perhaps access a, a little better. It was wonderful, one, one of the ladies said, well, there's my locker. And I said, it's probably the original locker. And she laughed and she goes, boy, if I could only remember my connection, I'd see if it still worked. So there was, there was a lot of, uh, good conversation. Uh, 
one of the classmates mentioned, uh, boy, I would love to connect with a teacher who made the biggest impact in my life. And I said, well, who's that? And he said, uh, Steve Ferreira. I said, well, the good news for you is I'm going to see him tomorrow at Dartmouth at 4 o'clock because it was the Shrine game. Mm -hmm. We had coached it in 88, and we were reuniting. So I took his contact information and gave it to Steve the next day. He was very touched now that he's been retired for four or five years. So once again, just an impromptu opportunity to do a tour, and you get a lot of, a lot of solid takeaways. And finally, in terms of just being aware, uh, we now are starting with about 10 other schools in the state. We have, I checked with it yesterday, we have 54 kids signed up for volleyball. It's co-ed. We're the only state in the country not to offer volleyball as a sport. It's a two-year exhibition sport through the BPA. And right now, the uh, initial response when I was in this afternoon a little bit watching practices you know, nothing but success. So you look at, you know, we're, we're in a good place where we now have 54 kids who would, for all intent and purposes, be not doing anything after school. And now they're gonna be playing volleyball right through the beginning of November. And it's just a wonderful thing to see. These kids are accessing a really, really healthy uh, activity. Hmm. And I'll keep you updated on that. Uh, open house. Uh, September 19th, school report night from 6 to 6.50, and then typical uh, parents will follow their student schedule from 7 to 9 o'clock. Uh, I, I agree with Bob. He shared the sentiments. Not only was it extra clean, it seemed like they're ahead of schedule this year. And as we all know, the one campus, we added square footage, and they really were all over it this year, the maintenance crew custodial staff, so they should really be commended outstanding work. That's my report. Thank you, Rob. Do we have any questions for Principal Reardon? Yes, Alan. Uh, well, I, I went through and I read your comments regarding researching a joint career center. Did you want to say anything about that? Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. So, and I'd be curious to get your feedback on it as well. Um, Mary Beth Pirelli, as you know, one of the Lorraine community leaders with Life College Career, and we had the, the business faculty forum, Martin Luther King Day, and then the student focus forum in February. And we've met uh, jointly with CTE throughout the year in terms of trying to get a EHS CTE career center, and we've always talked about space. So we got all these tentacles converging at once, and uh, she did as a project uh, towards the end of her class in the spring, looking at the space we have and, you know, what could we do to make this happen? As, you know, and I think Ryan's alluded to 2020 and, and other uh, board members looking forward. But, I, you know, I thought it was a wonderful representation. She was part of those, those uh, student-focused forums. And to take all the dialogue, the input, and to put forth a, a blueprint proposal like that is very impressive, and I know it very much is an intent. It's not just an Essex High School Career Center, but it would be a joint EHS CTE Career Center. And you know, I, I think where she's proposed it is is very intriguing. Uh, Mrs. Rath is in the audience, so I don't know how. She, I don't know if you've had a chance to see it because you were you were overseas back then. But uh, it's a, to kind of redesign the guidance lobby to a certain degree and expand. And, and we don't have a a student center, if you will. Uh, on campus, uh, so that would kind of help meet that need as well. But I, I just, she presented to the design team right before graduation, and we were just so impressed with her work. Okay. Uh, just more to come on the general conversation of space and redesigning space and different purposes. Right. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I, I did have two thoughts. Uh, one, I wanted to ask if the proposal had been vetted in terms of. Uh, health and safety in an emergency where there would need to be a very rapid uh, exiting of the school. Not yet. The fire marshal would have to weigh in on that, yes. Okay. I, I think that's an important issue. Mm -hmm. as whether or not the other doors on the opposite side would be closed and how they might be opened in an emergency. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, 
I usually get sometimes in trouble because I, when I'm asked a question, I give a more of a complete answer. But I did have a positive thought about one thing. So let me just share it with you. I like the courtyard space as a major uh, campus, one campus follow-on. Put in your, your center, bring IT back from AD, give up two classrooms to Bob, bring a multitude of those together in one place, and take the over-committed, over-registered courses for those two classrooms as a hedge of not receiving state aid. Just some thoughts, a multitude of thoughts uh, regarding how that project could work. Provide a revenue stream, help us manage with our tax bills, help with a number of things, and improve the overall uh, regional tech academy and capabilities for the region. Just a broader brush, but mm -hmm. uh, probably we need to talk more. But just a thought. Okay. I really thought it was very foresightful of the student to look at three different spaces and yeah. possibilities. Yeah. So that was. I, I like the idea of looking at it more globally across the needs of the entire organization and then moving forward from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think if, and I realize there have been some constraints recently on state aid, but I think if we hedge it right, it could be revenue neutral. Thanks. Okay. What would I, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, how do you um, how do you imagine this going forward? Well, it's one piece of a bigger conversation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. When we when we met with the group, uh, they they continue to work. I, I, I the design was great. I think the idea is a great. What we challenged the group to do was think more from a services and curriculum standpoint um, before we commit to space and. And, and construction. Um, I'm concerned in a good way. I'm curious about how they see a tech center and a high school sharing a, a dual space and uh, addressing concerns about you know we've got regional responsibilities. They've got they've got local yeah. responsibilities, yeah. but they're they get it. All the teachers are committed to it. They continue to work on it, and I think they'll come up with some some pretty interesting ways of answering those questions. I suspect we'll be called to a meeting real soon. I, I'm sure that's a good thing. But I, I do think that you bring up the good points about the, the differences between the organizations. But at the same time, the bottom line is when either when, when any student leaves either CT or VHS, you need to be career and or college ready. Right. Period. Right. Yeah. So that's the unifying link. Right. So. I am. Um, I was fascinated how another concept kind of baked itself into this, and that is sort of that idea of space for students to practice handling more freedom for their action. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, this building, one of the ways this building serves us so well is that it's rather institutional, so that you know we can buy large floor cleaners that can go down hallways mm -hmm. and loop around and so forth. But it, it also, is very institutional and <laughs> not very representational of the 21st century that the kids are being prepared for. And um, you know, I, I I think there there may be some baby steps in some of these ideas mm -hmm. that are generally frightening to think of from our past perspective. But if we are going to create a future, you know, there there are things of like different furnishings that. That are um, that maybe aren't welded to the floor and other things like that. So there, there may be some steps in here that could start to bridge towards that game. Mm -hmm. Co couple things to, to look at as I look at it a little bit in terms of looking at the future. The architectural design of the High Tech High in San Diego, uh, New Tech High where we went, um, and also Franklin, Massachusetts is building a sixty nine million dollar new high school 
and their blueprint. It's a fascinating website. They've got the PowerPoint as to why they needed it. It's very obvious if you watch it. It was their their high school they're replacing, by the way, was built in 1970. And a lot of the reasons they're replacing is for architectural deficiencies. Where because I think we have our capital plan in a much better place. That's a sidebar commentary. But my point is the blueprints for the new high school, it's it's just fascinating to look at the design. Three, you know, multi purpose laboratories. Yeah. So, I mean it's just fascinating stuff. So well, I'll, I'll have a quick one and then one last one, one, uh, one. one last point to add a little bit more to this. I know Judy would love this. It would be nice to be at that point if the courtyard and a major project was developed at that point in time, but in the air conditioning we need for too old. Hmm. Can I just, the only thing I would just chime in, Jack, is I, what struck me is I, I liked the thought of the aesthetics of it also because I do think aesthetically yeah. the courtyard, there's so much potential there that we're really missing out on as far as a However you want to look at it, a, you know, a retreat space. There's so many ways you could use it, but I just think, you know, it could use, um, you know, maybe some attention and infusion of. Yeah. So there's a lot of potential there, as, as well as I think yeah. the front of the building too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. The thing that caught my eye and then we'll move on <laughs> was was kind of connecting back to the topic you just raised before this, and this is. I think this is an excellent opportunity for alumni relations to come in and participate. And we look at community involvement and life skill workshops and preparing for post-secondary opportunities. What better cohort of people do we have than people who have been through this and who have those life experiences and who want to contribute back to our high school and our technical center to be able to work something out that we can take advantage of that. And I think this would be a good place for that to, to occur. But I, I, rec I recognize there's work to be done here, and I think uh, this board is interested to see how this is progressing, and uh, we look forward to hearing more as how this goes forward in the future. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, questions for Rob? Hearing none, we'll move on to our uh, multiple pathways and phenomenons. I see that. Uh, Michelle Rath, Dr. Rath, is in the audience this evening, and she's going to lead us through this discussion. Welcome back to Thank North you. America. Um, <laughs> I would love to catch up with you sometime on that trip, but uh, that's not what we're here to do tonight. <laughs> and and uh, we look forward to it, so Michelle. Should I sit here? Or? Uh, actually, I almost would prefer for you to come up okay. here and be with us. Okay. I'm going to give out a few handouts. And these are double-sided documents. And how fitting that we are talking about alumni. One of the handouts is called the Navi's Alumni Tracker. Yeah, it is a good segue. Do you want me up there, Jack? Yeah, yeah, okay. tonight is just give you a brief overview of this new tool that we're going to be using. Um, it's called Naviance and it has been used in the past, I would say primarily as a way for schools, students, and parents to begin 
the college search process. And it is a web-based program. And the beauty of the program is that it has the ability to link with many of the school's data systems. So in our case, we are using PowerSchool. And when we uploaded Naviance and joined the program, we were able to link PowerSchool and Naviance together. What that means is that every school, every student in Essex High School can create an account. And the account is not just for the students, the account is also for the parents, the account is also for the school counselors, and the account is also for the students' teachers. And the purpose, the way that we're, we're using it is multiple, multiple usages. We as counselors rolled it out last year when we met with our juniors. And typically in the early new year, we meet with our juniors and we begin the process of talking about course selection for the coming year. And when we begin to talk about course selection for senior year, we automatically begin the discussion of what are your plans for the future? Where do you see yourselves? How do you need assistance getting to where it is that you'd like to go. And at the time that we met individually with each of our juniors, we actually had them log on and create the account. And we used that opportunity to begin exploring what Naviance had to offer them as students, them and their families, their parents or guardians, and how we as school counselors can use it in our planning um, for the future year and a half. The document that's titled Naviance gives you a very quick overview of what Naviance has to offer. And what I will tell you is that there is the basic service that Naviance provides, which is the um, course planning, it's the college search process, and the linking with the student database. There are additional modules that we have actually purchased to be used with our students. The not modules that we've chosen are um, a learning styles inventory that we are planning to use with all of our freshmen. So actually beginning tomorrow, when we meet with our freshmen, we'll begin the discussion and we're going to set up individual appointments with each of our freshmen to do the learning styles. The other piece that it has is a career planning interest inventory module called Do What You Are, and we'll be using that with our sophomores and or using it through the career uh, unit in the computer applications classes. And um, the other module is one that's called the Individual Learning Plans, which is a separate handout, which is part of the new legislation that the Agency of Education has introduced. And there was some discussion last week at the um, education leadership team around how that might be um, folded out, who might be using it, will it be started at the middle school and be something that will follow the student up, is there something that we can create so that it can indeed be used over multiple years with students? So that's something that's in development and under discussion, but just know that this tool called Naviance is something that we can use for that purpose. So we have an instrument that we can use to meet the legislative mandate. We can also use it as far as counselors and parents and students go around making some decisions as to a student's path through their high school career. Um, another piece of what we use it for, currently in both the high school and I believe at the tech center, there is a lot of discussion as to how students plan and choose the courses that they take. And we begin this discussion when we go into the middle schools to start talking about transition to high school. And certainly, at the high school level, we have discussions when we're talking about course selection with respect to technical education and CTE. 
So now, instead of using something that is paper and pencil, we will have something that is electronic and can be accessed again by the student, by the counselor, by the parent, and even by the teachers. So the teachers are able to see what the student's path, projected path is. And I always say to people, when we did it on, pe on paper, we used pencil because it's something that is constantly being modified and changed. When you do something electronically, obviously you can continually modify and adapt it based on the student's path as it unfolds. So we'll be using it for that purpose. And for our seniors, current seniors, and our rising seniors, we'll be using it for college search process. The beauty of this instrument is, again, as students begin the whole search, where, where do I want to go? How am I going to get where I want to be? And start creating lists of colleges. All of that will be kept in this tool. So I, as a counselor, can go in and look at my seniors and see their list as it's unfolding. And if I suddenly think of a college that I think might be a good addition or something that they might want to look at, I can add it electronically to their list along with a note. Jack, I think you may want to look at Clarkson for these reasons. And then you have the option, obviously, of considering it or taking it off your list. We can also use it. Um, I'm sure you're aware that many colleges actually come to the high school beginning next week all the way through April to visit. And we'll be able to send our seniors and our juniors emails about the various college visits, instructing them how they can set up appointments and actually meet with the college reps. So all of this, instead of announcements, instead of emails, this can all be done electronically. And our hope is, as more and more schools go paperless, we're going to have an electronic means of collecting, planning, selecting, applying, sending transcripts, all of that will now be done through this instrument. And from what I've heard from all of my colleagues who have been using it for a number of years, it's incredibly efficient, it's a, a very um, easy, accessible tool. We'll be doing trainings for parents and community members who want to learn more about it. We've already rolled it out, as I said, to our juniors last year, our current seniors, and we'll be introducing it to our freshmen. So slowly, slowly, we're taking the steps to introduce it to EHS students. And I think it's going to be hugely uh, successful and very effective. In addition to the alumni, yes. is this something where, you know, obviously you'd be starting with the data of the first class that you started with, and so it, it has the potential to build an alumni base. Is there, is there an ability to kind of input past yes. data to build, okay, so yes. build In data. fact, each, each year um, when we have a senior meeting, which is typically mid-May, mm -hmm. We have a senior survey that we have students fill out, and on that survey we ask students to indicate what their plans are for the next year, to provide us with an address, both email and a physical address, in addition to someone else with whom they're in contact. So it could be a neighbor, it could be a family member, it could be a close friend, and we have all of that data back probably 10, 12 years. So we've kept that, and my registrar and our secretary could easily enter that data into the system so that we, in fact, would have longitudinal data for the past decade, at least. And do you know if this has the ability to say, do a mailing? Absolutely. You know, okay. It That's can great. do a it physical a mailing. Newsletter. Okay. It can address envelopes. That's it can great. send emails. Um, it, it's really an amazing thing. So it could do all of that instead of having somebody creating all the labels, mm -hmm. sticking them on an envelope and mailing them out. That's right. Yeah. How would this uh, affect or the skills or the uh, work of the guidance department today? It's stretching us. <laughs> 
Um, we, I mean, I, I think certainly in the 13 years that I've been working in school counseling, I've seen the whole process and the whole role of the counselor evolve. Each year it evolves more and more. Um, I remember when we used to sit with the view books and look at the view books, paper on, and now all of that is electronic. You can do college tours electronically. Um, so I think we're relying more and more on technology. And so to be able to have the tracking system and selection system on a computer that can be accessed by so many different people, I think is really great. Um, I have to say we as school counselors are still getting up to speed. This current senior year is going to be our year of guinea pigs, but Naviance has a track record that is um, unbelievable. So I'm sure that we'll fumble our way through, the students will teach us how to use it, and it'll be great. <laughs> There's going to be a learning curve. Right? Yeah, yeah. But, but for example, two years ago, um, the, there's something called the Common Application, which is an application that more and more colleges and universities are using. So it used to be that you would fill out separate applications for each college to which you were applying. Now there's one application that you fill out, and at last count there were over 500 colleges that are using this common application. And two years ago, that went electronic. So we had to learn how to send teacher recommendations, student transcripts, uh, mid-year reports, all electronically. And that went fairly smoothly. So I'm sure that this will just be sort of another step in that process. Mm -hmm. yeah. This kind of question, I don't understand a whole lot of this technology stuff. So, uh, Naviance to communicate to the colleges, universities. They don't need to have Naviance. I mean, communicate with whatever they have. With whatever they have, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? So, uh, go ahead, Brian. So, where do we stand with personal learning plans right now? As far as an issue, what's our, what's the plan? So, in your org notes, um, the multiple pathways. Um, legislation was included as far as the initiatives yeah. are concerned. Uh, so we're mandated through a rolling schedule to begin November 30th, 2015 to have personal learning plans in place for 7th graders, ninth graders, and then students in grade uh, 11 and 12 if they are dual enrolled. We are, uh, as Michelle said, piloting sooner this work so we're in a good position to be ready for this so we're starting now this readiness timeline that she's sharing with you uh, because we have the tool and what was great um, as she mentioned about our our leadership team was to see if our middle schools um, could also use this tool as, tool as well so we have that seamless uh, transition for students 7 through 12. Mm -hmm. So we're exploring, she's meeting with middle school mm -hmm. principals to see how that uh, alignment could work and um, even though it's a 2015 um, requirement, we're starting now so that our readiness will be there and then ultimately by November 30th, 2018, all students grades 7 through 12 will have personalized learning plans. So, so the so kind of going out with nine, ten, eleven, twelve, seven, eight, all all kind of at once. No, so it's seven, nine for grades eleven, seven, nine, and eleven and twelve if they're dual enrolled mm -hmm. in November of twenty fifteen, and then twenty sixteen you'll add eighth graders yeah. into. So see that. yeah, I, I guess I'm just wondering what how how much of an attractive nuisance will the capability be to rolling it faster than some uh, kind of uh, patient rollout? No, I don't think that'll okay. that'll be an issue. I think the issue is more um, creating a template that would be acceptable at both the middle school level and be able to transition with the student to the high school yeah. level. Yeah. 
and there's a committee that's been um, established at the state, the Agency of Education, uh, to inform what that template may look like um, and the tools to um, assist this process. And in January, we're supposed to be receiving guidance throughout the state on these how to develop these plans, what the template looks like. Mm -hmm. Those guidance, got that guidance is forthcoming in January. Tom Alderman, one of the members of the Agency of Education, we met on May 24th, and he's well aware that we're looking to utilize the personal learning plan and Naviance as our mechanism for PLPs. So he's going to be making sure that that's one of the items that's discussed at the table as well. Mm -hmm. So we had a meeting in Montpelier. You mentioned many of your colleagues are using it. Do you have a sense of what number of schools in Chippewa County are using them? I'd say we are one of the last to sign on. I know CBU's been using it for seven years and SB for six years, and then schools like Vermont Commons, um, MMU, BFA Fairfax, are just, they're about a year ahead of us. Is your sense that they are using the ILP function already? I know, or I know CBU is. Um, I have a daughter who's using it, so. Um, but I don't know about the other ones. I know that they're definitely using it for learning styles, for the um, interest inventory and for college search. One of the concerns CTE has is how, what role we're right. going to play in helping students achieve their learning plans, or do we do the learning plans on our own? Right. And if we're dealing with nine schools with, let's guess, five different formats, mm -hmm. um, some electronic, some paper, right. with different features, it would be an interesting time. Well, th that's where a statewide state committee guidance. would really be helpful. <laughs> yep, that's how. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and the irony is that we, as school counselors, have been doing that every year we get together at the beginning of the year with all of our freshmen. But what we've come to find out is that there are many individual teachers who also use it because they see that it's critical in getting to know their students. And so to have one instrument that everybody can use and have access to, I think will be great. Mm -hmm. Not redundant. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's really helpful when these mandates come forward that there's some form of standardization mm -hmm. because of, especially when they affect, you know, pre-K through 12 systems um, and our opportunity to align our resources uh, in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So I have great hope that this committee will um, provide with, you know, more than guidelines and more guidance and direction. Um, so that we can be on the same page, especially for the sake of CTE students. Mm -hmm. Well, I would also, yeah, I would also uh, echo we're in a similar boat where we have students from five, mm -hmm. and with school choice now, it could be mm -hmm. more than yeah. more than ten right. with school choice. Uh, so, yeah. well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I thank Michelle for coming tonight because um, it foreshadows for the board the wor work we're doing to be in compliance with the multiple factors uh, initiative. And um, it was really exciting to hear the conversation at our leadership team meeting um, to start planning the week together. Um, and to keep in mind our middle schools and our, and our other schools that send to our campus. So. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for taking the thank time. You. I know it's so incredibly busy right now. But I just, I just want to say thank you to the board for supporting the the funding of this because we've been asking for it for a few years, and I know that budgets have been tight, and I think the timing is right on, and I think it's going to be really useful as far as how we move forward. So thank you for the support. Have a good thank evening. You. Thank, thank you. you.
Yeah. Uh, just, just to add on, on a personal note, I, and I think uh, Superintendent DeNovo would may, may recall this, about three years ago when I was going through the final bit of college search and selection process, I had been tracking uh, some online message boards and the, the term Naviance kept popping up from people all over the country. And I said, what is, you know, kind of, what is this thing? And I got some information that would, you know, like through the parent portals from, from various countries, just representative data that would come through. And I was just awestruck at the information that was available uh, on that, on the uh, college career, uh, uh, college planning and career opportunity data that was being made available to parents to help with help, you know, and not and not just academic, but also financial information that was in there. Um, uh, it was it was awesome, and I, I, I shared with with uh, uh, Mike Deweese and Judy and actually Amy Cole at the time because I kind of viewed this as being a curriculum instruction and uh, assessment tool for individual learning plans that this is something that we needed we needed to engage with so i too am very happy to see us <laughs> on this because i think it's 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 amazing and uh, i'd be willing to talk about this more at a, at a, at a, at a different venue but uh, nevertheless good information so okay um the updates to the ccu wide website uh, is that something you were going to talk about? It is about? something I'm okay. going to do. I'd, I'd like to do calendar two. You want to do calendar two? Okay, and so in the agenda, we'll, okay. we'll flip flop. We'll do the calendar 2.0 overview first. Calendar uh, 2.0 is a proposed calendar. I'm going to provide you uh, an overview with some context and um, information um, so that you have some understanding when community members might approach you about what is this, um, where it come from, what's it about, and you have some talking points uh, and a means of getting some information about the calendar beyond this presentation. So the conversation originated with uh, Champlain, Champlain Valley Superintendents Association, and this is a group of regional superintendents. There's approximately 17 of us. We meet monthly. Uh, superintendents come from Addison, Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle counties. And um, one area that we're required by Vermont law is to create school regional school calendars and we need to do that for areas that have technical centers so that we have common 175 student days in the calendar so the mandate comes from title 16 section 1071 and we've been doing this for many many years um, typically you don't hear about the calendar until January because most of the time there are very few changes made to it. I will say also at this point in time that the common 175 student days are regional in nature and do not include whatever local uh, agreements you have with your teacher associations for additional days. So in 2010, we've really been talking about this for over six years now, and in 2010, CBSA charged a task force to really uh, study um, alternative models uh, and recommend a calendar based on an agreement about principles uh, that we build upon. And you probably remember last year I uh, did a presentation um, that the Vermont Superintendents Association did on the, on the quality framework that was created. Mm -hmm. And during that time, um, we talked about, we were using the term vision calendar. At that time, we talked about moving from traditional, traditional annual school calendars and schedules to um, instructional, instruction and learning delivered anytime and anywhere and what that could look like. So this, this shouldn't be news to you. We've been working on looking at the structure for a while. 
So the guiding principles uh, that the task team identified, uh, including uh, most important, importantly, supporting learning for all students, and never has there been a time that every student is being required to achieve high standards. Um, the structure is really meant to meet the needs of today's youth and today's teachers. Um, you can see for yourself that we're looking about at providing timely interventions uh, and including enrichments um, during the school year for all students. Um, providing that best first instruction so there's less need for review. Increasing access to language, language rich environments with our demographics changing uh, and more new American Americans joining our schools, uh, those language rich environments are critically important. And also talking about how do we minimize that loss of learning that oftentimes occurs over that long summer break. Uh, we looked at some research about how a school calendar can support positive school climate through uh, creating um, a better distribution of pace. Um, with reasonable chunks of time to promote student learning. And in this proposed calendar, we're looking at approximately seven weeks of instruction, then two weeks off. Um, and we'll talk more about that as I get into the specifics. It's also um, about momentum and natural rhythm and balance throughout the school year. It's also an opportunity for us to look at uh, scheduling timely, timely teacher professional development during non-student days. Currently, it's um, a lot of our teachers are um, attending Common Core State Standards training um, at times when we have to um, have a substitute in their place to attend those training opportunities. So we're introducing here this concept of intercessions, that two-week uh, time period um, that is uh, currently expanded in this new schedule. It does still honor the traditional um, school vacations, so it does preserve that. We, we thought that there would be enough of a change to not uh, make it more difficult to not honor what is traditional currently. And it does maintain the 175 days. It distributes the student days more evenly. Uh, we've been thinking about ways to embed weather days, uh, which would create a more predictable end of the year. And um, in defining these intercessions as far as where does the time come from, it came from um, current abbreviated weeks. So we created whole weeks of instruction um, through those abbreviated days and weeks. Uh, when we presented the calendar to VIC, the Vermont Interscholastic Council, which is comprised of students from our nine high schools in Chittenden County, they were like, well, where did the, this extra time come from? And so as we explained, well, you see a day here and a day there, what we did was we blocked it. And they said it'd be really helpful if you show this calendar side by side so people can see, one, it's really not that dramatically mm -hmm. different than what we currently have in place. Um, and two, the biggest difference is it begin, the school year will begin five days earlier and we'll end five days later, which coincidentally, due to our four weather days this past year, it's scheduled to end on the same day that school ended last year for students. Um, what are some of the current issues uh, within the school calendar now? And our students during that meeting talked about how much their learning time is compromised. For example, um, if a class, uh, a humanities class is doing a field trip to the Flynn Theater, students have to say, okay, do I go on this, on this field trip and miss that math class or a test or they're compromised with always having to 
make decisions when multiple things happen during a school day. It's also, um, we've started a practice that the, the current Secretary of Education was opposed to, uh, but because there's such, a pre such pressure for professional development time, we have created early release days within the calendar now. Um, and those are not always in the best interest of students when you send students home. One, they typically don't stay for lunch. Uh, and two, they often go home to homes um, where there isn't any supervision or structured activity. Um, I already talked about the unpredictable end of the year, which is really difficult for child care providers as, as well as recreation areas where our pools are opened and we can't have people staffing the pools because they're still in class and this year was a huge challenge uh, for people who offer summer programming. Um, there's limited time in our current schedule for uh, internships and community connections as we're trying to promote those uh, personalized learning opportunities for kids. It's really difficult when they're mandated to seat time for class instruction. And also, uh, due to the increase in our standardized testing, um, we have high student absenteeism, especially for our tech center, where there's a, a three-window, a three-week window of testing time in the fall for kneecaps, and there's also a kneecap testing window, the science kneecaps, for juniors um, twice a year. And during that six-week period of time, every school in the region makes their own testing schedule based on whatever's happening in each of their schools. And then Bob tries to manage that, knowing that it's difficult during those times to have full student attendance in programs. Um, some of the intersection possibilities that we've talked about and here I'm going to insert that I'm careful not to overpromise on this um, because I'm talking through the lens of possibilities right now. Um, but we are talking about the personalized learning uh, plans for students, which nicely followed what Michelle was talking about and with guidance people wanting to meet with each individual student. You know, our capacity to do that right now is severely limited. Also looking at timely, timeliness uh, for reteaching and some intervention. Right now, oftentimes if a student has a misconception that goes uh, on and sometimes it's not, um, an intervention is not made which builds on further misunderstandings. So being timely with that is critically important and not waiting for this summer school intervention time. Opportunity to engage with experts. Um, we're in this uh, county, we have many experts available in our communities, and having time for our students to connect with them is hugely important. Also, uh, interestingly, and this came from our students, um, balancing school time with homework and jobs and multiple activities that they participate in through music and sport, uh, sports and they're juggling all the time. Uh, in fact, one of the students was from Belgium and he was saying this is a calendar that's much more like uh, my calendar from my, when I attended school in Belgium and he said all I can say about that is that it was so much more humane. And right now, a lot of our students are, are organizing and petitioning boards to create policies like no homework policies because they're struggling to, to begin homework oftentimes at 11 o'clock at night after their sporting events and jobs and, and whatnot. So there's a lot to juggle. Um, and hopefully it helps us pace time so that there's space for that creation and reflection and involvement. For teachers, some of the calendar issues um, is that they've talked about is that there's limited time for meaningful teacher collaboration. There's 
the only time um, there's limited time for creating those personalized learning plans that we talked about earlier um, there's limited time to respond to early when students are struggling and there are no consecutive professional development times with the exception of the beginning of the year and the end of the year across our region so there's never two consecutive days when teachers can get together and there's now limited time for them to establish meaningful partnerships with community organizations i mean hats off to the wonderful work they've done in this area um, and i can only imagine what it could look like if they had additional time to to uh, develop those partnerships during intercessions some possibilities um, that could exist for teachers would be true analysis of student data where teachers were working collaboratively uh, in teams to look at some of that work uh, a customization of personalized learning plans and some partnerships um, and involvement to extend learning opportunities some calendar cons issues for families uh, we're finding it's very difficult for families to schedule routine appointments like doctor's appointments and dentist appointments and oftentimes kids are being released from school uh, as well as um, uh, these early release and abbreviated weeks are creating some some true child care issues um, there's limited time for extended family trips and oftentimes principals are receiving requests to approve vacations beyond the time that's identified in our current calendar uh, and teachers are being asked to create um, lesson lessons for students while they're away on vacations um, many of our families are coping with students that have summer boredom some of you might be in that situation now where they've been anxious to return for the last two weeks to school not sooner and it also um, there's limited seasonal experiences for families summer has lots of opportunity but there's really limited experiences throughout the four Vermont seasons so the possibilities may include um, evenly distributing time to accommodate for those appointments and those extended family trips um, again to improve that balance in family life to access quality child care that may be able to uh, be furnished right at the local uh, neighborhood schools and to take advantage of Vermont's wonderful four seasons so what are some of the logistics behind this well there's various needs and quality child care is number one uh, as well as enrichment tutoring and remediation professional development and transportation to name just a few I will tell you that this calendar does not present any new need we, these needs are with us every year in our current calendar so they're not new to us um, but there's limitations in how that we can currently address them so we organized a partner summit on July 23rd um, to explore what we could do as far as creating some quality programs and as you know the state was involved in an effort to create a statewide calendar years ago um, and that effort um, was not successful and I would propose that one of the reasons it's, it wasn't successful is because there's a lot of grassroots efforts that need to happen through partnerships for quality programs to occur at the local level so this is sort of that grassroots effort to begin having those important conversations about uh, working together on behalf of our students um, 64 people attended this summit uh, 13 had statewide and cross-region uh, partners uh, they included organizations such as the Flynn Theater and the Barry Mary Theater and recreation programs they all came to the table and um, with them 18 after-school programs came to the table along with seven superintendents and six libraries and started talking about what opportunities could be made possible for students for teachers and for families in working together 
um, we talked about lots of opportunities for regional and local programs to be created and or expanded. Some of, our pro some of those programs have funding connected to them, like the 21st Century Grant and um, some regional resources as well. We're trying to keep in mind whatever could be offered, that it would be offered with little or low cost to families so all students would have opportunities. And to make sure whatever's being off offered also aligns with our local schools. And ultimately we want to increase the use of school facilities. Currently there's 10 weeks of summer vacation. There are some programs that happen during that summer time. Um, but that's a pretty big stretch of time um, for the facilities to be um, untapped to the, to the level they could be used. Um, you probably remember each of the boards participated in that 30 questions that our communication task team members um, act activity to, to understand what your questions would be about this. This is um, the same event, the same activity happened with those students in BIC uh, across the nine high schools in Vermont. And, and they were really focused of all the groups most on learning. Um, and that came up repeatedly and transitions and the difficulty with that. To their credit, most student councils, um, those students attending were 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. And they were saying, well, this probably won't be something that will affect our school careers, which is sort of a sad statement to hear. Um, but they were really uh, engaged for the benefit of underclassmen, which I thought was quite honorable for students to be thinking about um, the kids um, that, are, that are younger than, than them, where they may have the opportunity to benefit from these changes. Um, there's uh, a blog spot called School Calendar 2.blogspot.com where information has been posted about this calendar. Um, and there's a reader's corner there with all the frequently asked questions that you can peruse to see some of the reoccurring questions and what the responses are to those. So that when people uh, in the community come to you as board members to ask questions about the calendar, you have a place to refer them for additional information that might be helpful to them. Because there is a lot of misinformation out there. There's concerns that this is a school uh, year-long school calendar and just a lot of erroneous information. So please um, recommend folks uh, and refer them to this spot. Um, the regional superintendents are going to hold four regional forums um, to engage with the communities uh, about this calendar. This, the regional superintendent's intention is to hear um, what possibilities might exist. It's not about selling this calendar or um, you know, not thinking about any changes to it. We've already heard some great recommendations on how to improve its current structure and want to hear more uh, through these engagement opportunities. I'll say now, as I've said in many opportunities I've had to speak about the calendar, this is not a done deal. This is the beginning of a conversation about the needs of today's youth and today's teachers. And it requires that we come together and talk about these needs so that we can have the opportunity to change some archaic structures that are really limiting our opportunity to meet some of the students' needs. After um, our leadership uh, summit, uh, principals recommended that we hold um, educator forums as well. Uh, so teachers will have an opportunity to also share their thoughts uh, and opinions about Calendar 2.0 toward making whatever necessary adjustments or improvements might be possible. So I'll be meeting um, the first four Mondays of September, um, September 9th with ADL, um, the following September with Summit and Hiawatha staffs, 
the third September uh, week in September I'll be meeting with EHS, CTE, and Fleming School, and October and uh, the last of September uh, I'll be meeting uh, in Westford. So we'll engage uh, with teachers, and again, I'm hoping that information will further inform and improve. Um, and also, hopefully, our teachers will be uh, across the region uh, in attendance at some of these regional forums as well. So that's the presentation. Um, I'm open to any questions that you might have or comments at this time. Well, this is the second time I've heard this presentation, and so I'm beginning to see where you're coming from a little better after hearing it repeated the second time. But one of the questions when I reflect on all of this, and I always go back and try to do my research, mm -hmm. and other districts or studies that have made a similar kind of change, is there any data available out in the rest of the internet mm -hmm. world? That's, <laughs> that's a frequently asked question um, that we receive. And what's interesting is it depends so much on, on local and regional needs. I'll give you an example. My first 10 years of teaching um, was in northern Maine. School started the first week of August. And we started then because the whole mid-month of September through October was potato harvest time in Rooster County. Mm -hmm. And all the schools closed so the students could harvest potatoes. Um, so depending upon regional needs, you know, school calendars are arranged really at local levels frequently. Um, there have been, we have visited um, schools in Arizona. Um, Elaine Pickney, who was the uh, deputy commissioner during the time and currently is the superintendent um, in Chittenden South, um, visited those schools and the reason why those schools were visited was because of their high achievement results. Um, she learned through that visit that to have that balance also helped kids to self-regulate and to have that time to be more ready for learning opportunities. So there was a direct impact on discipline data and positive school climate. So we've learned from different uh, places. Um, there's a link there to um, states across the nation that have used different uh, calendars to meet their needs. Um, it's a great research uh, piece to review. And I, and I think that there's no, you know, perfect calendar. If there were, we all be doing it. Um, I think it needs to be adjusted locally and we have to look at it through the lens of resources mm -hmm. and through conversation mm -hmm. um, about creating those quality programs during times when uh, these intercessions take place. Just as we have during that extended summer um, time currently. It's two things. Is, um, it's, it's definitely built on the premise that 175 is the number. I know that's today's yes, number, today's number, but it's it's trying to take research and trying to be aspirational mm -hmm. for certain outcomes and changing our learning and our environment, all built around 175 being the magic number. Because it's our current resource allocation, and we didn't think we could propose a change that would require our taxpayers. So it'd be interesting to see. Again, I, I think you always have to be resource-wise, yes. but you can't design an airplane resource-wise and leave the wings off. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be interesting to see where this is to evolve to, Absolutely. so that it's transparent that it that it may be a fund, you know, maybe a change now, but it has an evolutionary period to it. Mm -hmm. As well as you know, I would love to hear from through these forums about people's opinion about the 175. Yeah. So it's, it's a great opportunity to begin those needed conversations. Good. And my second question is the 175 is also as established as the 186 mm -hmm. and 184, you mm -hmm. know, depending upon the contract that we have. Right. 
So does the intercessions have teaching happening within the contract or those extra duty stipends or those? Those are possibilities that we're talking about now. Um, at the leadership team meeting, um, what was crafted was locally a model for our SU. We inserted what we believe would be the best place to schedule our teacher uh, professional development days. So we have that designed as well as inserting um, some makeup weather days uh, in that May time frame. Um, so we localized it according to our 177 student days and our 189 professional development days. So each contract throughout the county, of course, is different. So we're going to need to show at these regional forums some models of what it would look like. Because when you see that initially, you don't see the insertion of those PV days or those additional days. So it looks like a lot more vacation time than you're, you're used to seeing in the school calendar. And that's because there's 14 days now scheduled into what you, you saw um, through the common 175 days. Because I think that's the biggest question that, I mean, it, it sounds like the ultimate goal of doing this, one of the ultimate goals was to try to prevent regression that happens. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess it still wasn't necessarily adding up to me when I looked at the new calendar. I wasn't seeing, I guess I'm still just not seeing it. And, I, and I'm stuck on that number because I'm having a hard time understanding how we're going to provide instruction during the intercessions and not mess with this magic number mm -hmm. and where those resources will come from. And also, my, my big question is, who's going to manage all this? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, is the SU going to manage coordinating the, the volume of all of these programs that we're talking about? I mean, it, it sounds to me like there, there seems to be a piece missing, which is kind of from the resource allocation perspective mm -hmm. of, so now who's, who's going to manage all of these intercession opportunities? What are they going to be? Who's going to program it? And who's going to staff it? So that's that's still, I think, a big question that, that I have about it, too. And that's um, why those engagement opportunities are mm -hmm. providing us, and those partnerships, when mm -hmm. we meet with our partners, an opportunity to talk further about yeah, what will that look like. Um, Mark Andrews, uh, Superintendent Essex Town, and I met um, with our local partners, um, actually during, after one of the leadership team meetings, was that only a week ago? <laughs> a week ago. Okay. And uh, and our our after school partners have assured us that as soon as they know when those days are, that they can provide program. Um, so we're fortunate in Essex Junction that our uh, Essex Junction Mexican Parks is also managed through the school system. So. Uh, we have some opportunities already in place, um, but those conversations are really bringing um, an opportunity for us to uh, think through new opportunities during that time. That's going to take time, and that too is going to be an evolution uh, process. I think, you know, the first year out of the gate, there may be only some norming that happens during those uh, times. and some limitations around programming uh, and reteaching opportunities. We'll have to see um, as this gets stru further structured what can be made available um, and, that, and then to see how we can grow that. So um, it's, it's going to take an evolutionary path that um, ultimately will improve opportunity for all students to achieve those high standards. And is this something that's definitely happening for the, the, the targeted time frame of the new calendar? So this is definitely going to happen in this year. There will be a new calendar. Well, there will definitely be a calendar that year, but I think it will be based upon the engagement conversations that okay. we have. 
So so that people are saying, yeah, yeah if, if people are saying for this coming year, mm -hmm. how about this? Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a common message across the region. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not in a position to want to impose this right. calendar at all. Right. We just want to be open to listening to what could be possible mm -hmm. and for people to come to the table with the mindset of how can we structure it a little differently and to engage in that kind of conversation versus um, just saying no to change because they weren't a part of the process. Mm -hmm. That's our all the engagement going to be filmed and recorded? We're working on um, having our ATN support our work with them. That be helpful for those that can attend. They can attend. And you, you don't have to attend uh, the forums. You know, you can attend any of the forums. You don't have to attend the ones. The first one that happens here, October 2nd, it's just convenient because it'll be here at the EHS cafeteria. Um, but there's, you can also attend the other three. They'll be very, they'll be um, structured very similarly. In fact, we've been fortunate to have Heart and Soul, who's done a lot of work in this community around engagement opportunities, um, help facilitate a structure that would um, improve engagement. Um, and also they train many facilitators. Um, Heart and Soul, I've included information as far as the September 25th date in your org notes as well. After their work of collecting qualitative data all year long, they are ready to move from research to action. And on September 25th, there's going to be the opportunity to see how to put those values that have been identified into action, and I'm quite pleased um, to announce, and I'm sure many of you are all are already keenly aware that education is the number one value in this community, um, and that's why I think it holds great promise for people to come together and brainstorm collaboratively about what we do to continue to make improvements for student learning. Thank you, Judy, for that uh, discussion. Now we'll, we'll go into the CCSU World Wide Web site Changes. discussion. Can change. I'm all about change today. Yeah. <laughs> um, the primary thing for you to know about um, our website is that we're looking to have a more contemporary presence um, and through that lens, we're trying to create a mobile-friendly environment. So this new page is being um, created so that it is something that you can see right on your um, mobile phone. Um, but in doing so, it meant relocating some of the information. So I'm just going to give you a very quick um, preview. Uh, instead of having at the top here, all of our schools listed, which we have in, the, in our current site, all of our schools are going to be listed in one area that will be a drop down menu. And then what used to be on the right hand scroll bar in the site is now going to be across the top. So some of the common tools that we use, um, some of the additional facilities, HR, our boards, those are all going to be located across the top. So I just wanted to have an opportunity to show you some of the proposed changes. We're not looking to make um, changes to the web until the end of September and have an opportunity hopefully during orientation meetings with our families to talk about what some of those, uh, what some of those changes could look like. We have a test site where, where um, constructing this in a whole different environment. We've shown it to several groups already for, for their in, in, insights. Um, and we'll continue to um, use the feedback that we've been receiving. Um, in the left-hand section will be a quick links. And this you can customize yourself, whatever you think is the most important quick link to have. Um, the school port is a place where you can sign, uh, log in. We wanted to make that look more prevalent because oftentimes we've been receiving calls that people couldn't access different information. 
uh, and that's because they weren't logged into the site. So this should make that more prevalent. And our upcoming events um, will be continue to be highlighted on the left hand scroll bar. We've done things like, you know, the footer at the bottom is slimmer, it's the same footer. It, it was just really looking at um, at, a, at a means of creating a more contemporary look. Is this, uh, does this logic and, and um, what carry over to all the schools? Yes. So what was along the left is along the right, what was on the right is now yes, on the left? Yes, it's the same. Is this, are you proposing this just for the mobile version? No, the mobile version and it's, so you're saying this, this is, this is what the, the new site will look like. like. Mm -hmm. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. No, <laughs> We've been working on this website. Because it's just like, I, like right now I'm, you know, looking at the current yeah. version and this is, this just makes so much more sense, you know, because there's just not so much stuff. On it's, your yeah, side. it was too compact mm -hmm. and so people were having trouble you know, mm -hmm. accessing some of the information. Mm -hmm. So it's a better use of the real estate, let's say, mm -hmm. um, to make it uh, breathe better. And the customizable option that you'll have to basically, was it like five things you can choose with whatever right. your top? It'll all be customizable so people have easy access to those mm -hmm. things that they want to um, connect with on a daily basis. Am I going to get a CCSUBT app? Anytime soon. <laughs> 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 okay. Let's well, so uh, I'm really excited about these changes because we, right. you know, we developed this. We'll say our website now would be like the age of a second grader, so it's been about seven years old, and uh, we developed it from scratch. Um, so now it's really exciting to see it move into this next iteration. Um, it'll have you know, the symbols for Twitter and your RSS feeds, much more contemporary look than, than we currently have. And so it will get, get utilized. The utilization of the website once mm -hmm. you have this new version, it's going to go For three ninety nine months. months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why didn't you recommend that earlier, right? Well, you didn't ask me. You didn't ask me. <laughs> So that's just a quick preview. We'll send you a link to the test site so you can play with it yourselves. Um, and again, we'll make it available to our principals uh, for um, orientation night so parents might have access and an opportunity to discover it as well. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Next is, uh, our next item is our report from our board task teams. We have three that we're looking forward to hearing from this evening. Communications, policy, and negotiations. Uh, I know you've been talking quite a bit for the past half hour or so, Judy, but I don't know if you want to fill us in on communications or, or do, should we have our board representatives talk about Albert Bardier and Gary okay. Baker. Okay. Gary had it over with me. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the photo. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm thinking, I feel like I can't. Yeah. We, did, we did get quite a presentation about 2 0, and, and that was, uh, you can see, there's, there's a lot of information, a lot of things to think about. Um, from the, uh, I think you can see the advantages, just all the things that Judy's listed. One of the uh, questions that I asked had to do with the air conditioning aspect of it because it's a longer school year and we're having warmer, uh, it seems warmer than usual, this year wetter, but <coughs> temperatures have been quite higher than, than I remember years ago. Um, so there could be some climate change issues that would require air conditioning in schools. One of the ways to bridge that is to phase this in over a period of time and then try to uh, uh, put those in at a later date. So phase certain activities during those warmer months for the students and plan for it. 
So I think I don't know how to, how hard or difficult or easy that was to do, but that was one of the areas. The second area that I just touched on was the research. And the only, uh, in my experience, the only schools that have done that have been the ones in which the community decided not to expand capital infrastructure space, but then created a year-round school in a smaller facility. And uh, I think it might be worthwhile to go back. If I get a chance, I'll, I'll do some research on that. See if I can figure out if there's a learning improvement from that environment versus conventional. We did talk about um, effective board meetings, and one of the suggestions was to add an agenda item to find out from board members, to pull board members before we leave, on what worked and what could be improved. I thought that was a good idea. Um, and Yes, um, leaders at work merging into the communications committee um, thought that uh, the basic message there was that it could be more effective in terms of communicating um, school board educational opportunities for all of the members that are there, then they could bring those opportunities back to their boards. Okay. That was good. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Uh, yeah. Policy, Brian, or are you our, you or Brian, our policy representatives, right? Is there any policy task team report outs that we can share? We haven't had a policy meeting. Okay. We didn't have our most recent one in August. July so was canceled, and we had some issues back in June as well. So, well, we will regroup and double down. Let's let's find. No, I, I I dare say, since we signed our most recent um, contract with the teachers association, also we haven't met any negotiating. We have the negotiations team hasn't met, nor has leaders at work had any meetings really, I think, since the second Wednesday in May might have been perhaps the last time that that, that task came in. So I understand we get into kind of a summer ball under calendar 1.0. <laughs> we might need an intercession here, though. <laughs> but uh, but but as uh, I think, I, I'm expecting that our, our task teams will be reintegrated again as the school year commences. So thank, thank you for reporting on our communications. Well, under not task teams of ours, but how about the, does the executive committee have an update on where it's progressing with regards to work ahead on search? As a matter of fact, there has been some progress just recently. Um, uh, just to backtrack and make sure everyone's up to speed on what's happening, the executive the executive committee or the board chairs from 46 and Westford and Prudential Committee, who, uh, as, as designated from the, the CCSU school board, have gone out on, on trying to, well, not trying, but um, making a recommendation for a superintendent search process. To that end, uh, a couple things, two key elements that have been going on on that. One element was uh, maintaining the the, the good order and administration while we go through a superintendent search process. And to that end, Superintendent DeNova is, is here um, maintaining the good work that we have, going, both in the past and going forward in the future. And uh, for the uh, uh, future work that's that's ongoing, um, we've engaged, in fact, just this week, we've uh, contracted with, I don't know if that contract is finally yet or not, but with Brian O'Regan, to be a facilitator in our uh, superintendent search and evaluation process. And that's the data that will be reported back out at our next CCSU board. But that's that's the progress that's been going on throughout. It's, it's been moving at a glacial pace, but it's been moving uh, this summer. So, and that's where things stand right now.
All right, uh, Brian, uh, board visioning work. Yes. Um, I think uh, so. Following our planning session, where Mary Jane led some work for us to begin the conversation, begin to understand a little bit more about appreciative inquiry. Uh, she and I met for a few hours. Her her takeaway was that her sort of by accident, her question of you know, waking up mm -hmm. in some future and starting to talk about it started to uncover the fact that there's only about six people in the world that think about U46. Um, and otherwise, everybody stands on the ground they stand on. And so this concept of a strategic plan for U46 is an interesting one to think about. And so you know, coming out of that, her recommendation is actually to, to stay within the, the confines of the proposal, but maybe to try to seat an advisory team earlier with a, with a substantial amount of internal stakeholders to explore this idea of U46. Um, I understand that facilities, as we look at the career planning, facilities are one of the easily identified intersection points that we have. But I, I think as we were playing around with it, and even that night, we were talking about a seamless educational experience for our students that maximizes their educational opportunities for personal learning. You know, this idea of what if there weren't two organizations? What if, what if the adults weren't involved and that the kids were sort of just intersecting throughout the seamless educational experience? What might that look like in our 21st century? Um, so there, it's interesting for us to play around with because I think it's pretty substantial on whether we're going at a U46 facility project and we're going to approach it strategically or whether we're looking at a strategic plan for U46 or whether we're looking at two distinct strategic plans for U46 and for, I mean, for CTE and EHS. And it's a little unknown at this point in time which one that's going to be. Um, so she thought that it would be valuable to come back in, have a work session with the board, to have some time to really understand what is the role of the advisory team, how those internal constituents and stakeholders could be involved in this um, appreciative inquiry process of asking the question and listening to responses about U46, about our direction. Um, and to work with the board to start to identify who are the necessary stakeholders that might be on that. So it, it's sort of like trying to start back at the beginning and saying, oh, wait a minute, we, we need to figure this out a little bit, which path we're going to go on. Um, and what is that sort of primary guiding question? So I would recommend that, you know, that it be considered September is not a time that we have a regularly scheduled board meeting that it, it may be one in which it might be um, possible for us to have a work session and devoted to the vision project. Uh, I think that will also allow us to better acclimate ourselves to what kind of involvement we're gonna have as a board in this visioning process. It's not gonna be something that happens outside of board work. You know, this is the, the concept here is for us to become really engaged in this. Uh, visioning and strategic planning process and not have it sort of assigned somewhere. And then that might seat us to have an ability to come into our regular scheduled meeting in October, have a smaller session incorporated into our meeting to talk about how the board works with the advisory team, what the concept and the hope is, and then going into November, which I think is another off month for us. Um, that November would be a time where we might be able to have our first meeting kind of with the advisory team and start talking about this. The idea, again, is to look at these established points in our calendar, of our, of our governance calendar, to see how we can get momentum discreetly on appreciative inquiry to then lead up and maybe do some kind of engagement around our annual meeting try to make our annual meeting have a little bit more uh, at stake of listening, you know, encouraging attendance not to hear us present, but actually encouraging attendance for us to listen. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm anxious to, you know, have the conversation, see what the will of the, the board is to have a September work session. If not, then we can look at the October board meeting. But we, I think we have a, we have a pretty fundamental question to, to answer about what path are we going. Um, we know that NEASC is asking us to look at things like mission, core values, you know, all those elements which seem like they're wonderful things to be asking, you know, the broadest stakeholder group imaginable through this lens, ideally. So we know we have some work, which pieces do we want to tackle? Any questions? Did anyone have that kind of, any reflection about the kind of the U46 uh, awkwardness? That we're. I think it's really good that that kind of got uncovered. Yeah. yeah. Because if it didn't come up then, it was really going to be a big snag at some point. Yeah. It just had to be. So. Yeah, and I think what's interesting is to recognize, even though Mary Jane, I wouldn't consider as an outsider she's done a lot of work uh, within the organization um, her her read on what we were saying about strategic planning for u46 and this is the u46 board and the u46 and so forth really led that when she, when we came to the question saying well we have one mission statement right where and everyone's like I, I don't think so I, I, <laughs> she kind of realized that it was like well wait a minute this is, there's a different story in actuality than this kind of beautiful umbrella. So, um, and I want to, you know, we, we need to do this within the idea of honoring our present and our past and designing our collective future. And so how we go about that, I think, is, is a process that we're all involved. I don't know if that's an agenda planning thing or a, a sort of a, a sign of interest by by the board now that they'd be willing to commit a night. So what is that the question you're putting before us right now, Brian? Is, is do we want to commit some time in September for a I'll call it a breakout board visioning, and that's our that's our sole topic for a September meeting. I mean, I personally, I would prefer to see it be a separate work session than try to tack it on to a board meeting. Uh, I, I really don't know if I can I be quite with functional. That. I'm sorry, Aaron, but yes, I would. I, I too would prefer to uh, make the time for this to, to occur in September rather than try and shoehorn it in on top of an already full agenda. Jimmy, but I'm, I'm, I'm open. Up. Right that there's no regular scheduled board meeting. And I was just looking at that. Actually, right. Um, there's um, your SU board meeting on the 30th, um, but there are no board meetings scheduled then. Um, and you were correct also um, last November. And those were intentionally structured in a way to it's work. Yeah. Yeah. And I think normally we might be at the end of it. Right now we're sort of just getting traction towards what, how, who, mm -hmm. when. And I think the next one is February that opens up for us. You might, a suggestion might be, I would suggest a Monday evening, September 16th, that's when we would have our normal third Monday of the month kind of CC, um, excuse me, U46 meeting anyway. Um, I, I know some of us have that Mondays and Tuesdays are better than other days of the week for uh, for work schedule kinds of things. And so I would offer that up as a, as a suggestion. Um, again, not knowing what Mary Jane's availability is either, and I think she's a, a key player in, Scheduling for this. Yeah, but we're scheduled to talk tomorrow. Okay. okay. 16th to 23rd, should one or the other be okay with me? Because we do have the, that week of the 16th on the 19th is the open house. Open house. Uh, 
there's a possibility I'm going to be out of town the week of the 23rd. So, so for so to deconflict where so I need to be the so week of the 16th is better for me. Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so thanks. I mean, that, that sounds okay. I can pick that quickly, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And she's available and what time? Uh, usual time? 6.30 or? Yeah. I'd accidentally be driving here for 6.30. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm keeping right? Ah, that's right. There's no meeting this month, but now I'll be mm -hmm. saved. So one of the things I was going to ask um, is uh, when that conversation happened, I was regretful uh, that we didn't have Bob or Rob attendance during that time and, and I think they could that's what I want to create more meetings for them but I think they're critical players or key players to invite absolutely if the board agrees. Yeah I, I certainly I, I think that I don't like to have the conversation I try to be as humane as possible for you know trying to keep people's lives together. But uh, I think this is important, especially at this point, because depending on how we go, it's going to be able to gauge better what kind of involvement there's going to be. So I'm certainly in favor of that. I think we can just, I don't think this is a something that we need to do for a second to set this meeting, but, but I would recommend Brian, that, that you go back in your discussion with Mary Jane tomorrow, you said? Yep. And, and offer up to see if she's available on the 16th, and then, you know, let, let the U46 board and administration know if that date works, or if it doesn't, what, what some alternatives Mary Jane can do, and we can um, decide on this. Okay. Okay. Any other uh, board visioning topic? That, Want to need to discuss this evening? I, I was going to ask uh, Brian because um, we're looking for some clarity around uh, the board's authorization um, to sign the contract uh, with Mary Jane Shelley. And um, I wanted to just make sure that we had that authorization. Brian had it so that we could get the contract signed. Yeah, I think that in the minutes, the last approval was yep on the advisory. And I think if the motion is a little bit more specific on um, who's authorized to sign, so sort of and like what. Um, you're right. I mean, I know that we have we can approve the budgeting process for it, so now it's just a uh, signature of who's authorized, who's authorized to sign. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, I, I don't know if this is, a, this is a procedural thing, it's not one as an action item. Right. Um, but I think it's just talking about the final action to um, complete the contract process. Mm -hmm. um, just so that it's in the minute, do you think we're fine? I think so. So maybe if the minutes reflected that, um, that the the board uh, agreed to have Brian execute the contract with Trifocal Consulting for the purposes of strategic planning. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? So we have a motion by Al, second by Jack. Brian to uh, act on behalf of the 46 board in signing the uh, contract with Trifocals. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6-0. So one of you. Okay. Brian, give me a thought. You said it's with Trifocal. Is there a second part of that? Trifocal Consulting. Consulting. So agreed to have you do that with Trifocal Consulting. What was the last part of that? Um, 
agreement for, for the vision for, plan. The, for the purpose for the purposes of the strategic plan. Thank you. Okay. Anything else on the uh, the visioning process, whether the, the process discussion or the administrative who can sign the paperwork discussion? Okay. Uh, Act 153-156 discussion. And we have in our org notes some background information, but uh, are you going to lead us through that this discussion this evening? I am. Okay. So we talked a little bit about this at planning day, uh, and I've included in the org notes um, for your background information the letter we received um, from Vaughn Ultimus on behalf of. Secretary Villasaka denying our approach for the Act 153 policy um, work that we've done and, and the procedure we've developed. Um, the reasons he stated were included within the letter um, and you also had an opportunity to see the letter that Dr. Dewey sent and his assertions that we would be able to meet the intent of 153 through this approach. Um, at this stage of time, I'm just asking this board to uh, make recommendations to you for your SU board members that will be making a decision at their SU board meeting as to whether or not to submit a waiver. There, we have drafted a waiver, um, and that will is being currently reviewed by your board council. Um, that waiver will be attached to your SU board orgs as well, so you'll, you'll have an opportunity to see that in advance, um, and an opportunity right now for you to um, advise your reps as far as your desire to either submit the waiver or not is the question before you. I, I just had one question. I tried to read through all this mm -hmm. jargon and there's some of it. But Vaughn's point that this is a clear cut requirement of uh, VSA 16261A60. A Six, really. Uh, what is it, or what specific point is it that we are wavering? The point uh, is that that he's making is that we're required to have a teachers associate collective bargaining agreement oh, okay. by law. Um, so before we, we can transfer any personnel. So if they're in a bargaining unit today, when they move, they need to be in the made whole by staying in a bargaining unit. So they could possibly be moving to a separate bargaining unit oh, separate as, bargaining one, unit. as one approach. Um, so different districts are handling it differently. Um, I should say different supervisory unions because it doesn't affect yeah at the district level. Um, some, some are already um, in a unified contract with their teachers, so this is not a difficult um, law for them to be in compliance with. Um, that's not our case. But, so, but I, I think uh, I've read all these documents. Uh -huh. and I, it sounds to me like if they're if they're part if they're currently employed by the CCSU and you're moving them out of their districts into the the CCSU rather than a district, 
they're still part of that bargaining unit, aren't they? Um, the problem would be there's no language in that agreement currently that authorizes the superintendent to transfer staff based on oh, 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 oh. So that's the missing piece in our current contract. And that would potentially give us three collective bargaining units if that happened in our district, right? Yeah. Well, right now we have two. Well, we have three different uh, contracts, one for Westbury, one for PC, oh, and okay. one for U46. We also have two support staff. That, I guess that's what I was thinking of. Okay, so, so this that's be five. So okay. this could be six. six. <laughs> seven. Or seven. seven. That's right. Because additional support staff contracts could be. <coughs> you have unionized support staff coming into a non unionized support staff employer. Right. And one of the decisions is whether to just move the teachers. And um, Joel Cook made a good argument about not moving the paraprofessionals because as well. Because we have contractability of working. Right. So, um, oh, so we're going to continue to explore uh, those opportunities. Um, but currently, we don't have, we can't do this in, without a new collective bargaining agreement. So in the next agreement, could the contract include everyone at the CCSU level? So the next agreement, um, since this waiver, I mean, since our policy approach has been denied, we share that information with the association so they're aware. Um, and they were supportive way back in the beginning of this conversation with the white paper that Dr. DeWeese wrote about, let's move everybody into the SU. Um, so there's still um, a need for us to figure out another approach. Um, I would definitely recommend that we do send a waiver um, to see if we could move forward through a pol policy venue. And then move forward at the same time um, with this issue as part of our collective bargaining work moving forward. What specific language does the waiver letter say? What is it? What is its content? It's about the ability for the superintendent to have authority to transfer. That's what what's currently missing, and or to have a separate negotiated agreement with two additional, or at least one additional, bargaining unit. But our waiver yeah. would be asking the state not to be required to do, to do this. Mm -hmm. Right. Or it will be required to enter a contract between the supervisory union and the support staff, as opposed to each individual district, right? That's what I'm missing. This, the so SU will get certified, certified staff for the first time. There's right. no certified staff. Well, there's some, yeah. but it's um, no. minimal. It's not like cool. um, our edits is in there, but there's grant support for that. There's a few exceptions to it, but it's definitely not a group. Um, there's just a few exceptions. But currently, the folks that the other end of that contract is the staff. There's the staff, and the other end of that contract is the district, right? Each mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. And that would be, it, regardless, it, that has to be the supervisor and the supervisor for that. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So, yeah. So there's a, there's it's complicated. That, yeah. And it's complex, you know, and it's something that. Um, and it may not yield any additional benefits. <laughs> exactly. Which is, I guess, goes towards and the efficiency. It may have a negative consequence. So we have to approach it thoughtfully, um, and I think it's going to warrant uh, further discussion uh, about our approach. So that meeting where this is going to be discussed is really at the SU level because it's the SU board's decision. So, so for this topic, for this board, for this evening, correct. You are asking U forty six. Please ask. Please restate what you're what you're looking for this board to act on this evening. 
for this board to advise their supervisory union reps, which is Ryan, Brian, and Jack, right. um, as to the direction you would like them to move in on this question coming before them at the meeting, which is whether or not to submit a waiver based on the letter that we've received rejecting our policy slash procedural approach. So, so in our board notes tonight, we've got that background information. I've heard Al request um, maybe a little, uh, what, what the waiver is that will be proposed at the CCSU board for, for U46 to review and, and at least be able to advise those members who are on the CCSU board whether that's an acceptable approach or not. Uh, is that yeah. fair to say, Al? Yeah, that's yeah. fair. Any other discussion on this topic tonight? The only concern I have is if they're in a union now and they get moved over and they're, they're considered non-union. No, they have another union. They have another union? You have to have another union. Another agreement, I should say. Another agreement. But they would be in a non-union position for a time period. They don't allow any transfer to occur before there is a negotiated agreement. Oh. So they would be protected. Yes. They won't move. We can't move anyone until we have a negotiated agreement. So the waiver just buys you time. Got it. I say we should probably do the waiver then. Or the yeah. waiver can avoid the need. Or the mm -hmm. If it's true. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think, you know, I mean, at, at least at the SU level, I, I think I, I need to understand a little bit better the cost of us going through a waiver process, yes. which is undefined and has not yet that's been acted correct. on by the secretary yet of any waiver that's been submitted to that's it. That's correct. What that cost is mm -hmm. in comparison to the cost of, of what, you know, harking back to challenges for change and the 200 districts that didn't comply with that legislative mandate. <coughs> so I, I think that there's a lot in balance here. I mean, there's no waiver. We'll be developing our own waiver. Correct. There's no waiver process for them to judge upon it. Correct. So we, no don't, we don't know the criteria. They've yet to... And they Tell postponed us. the deadline at least once in the last legislative session. Right. So is that should would that mean that an option would be to do nothing? Just no, no, it's state law. But I mean, can we just hold off and see what happens, sort of thing? Well, I think the risk in in sending in a waiver without knowing what the criteria is. Um, certainly gives the people in the position to approve or deny a waiver the upper hand because well, we don't can't make your argument very solid. Exactly. Yeah. But we can explain why this approach could meet the need mm -hmm. um, and identify some of the inequities uh, that are currently existing and the fact that we have a history of a shared service model. It's not, we already, our boards already know um, and have procedures in place to share services and probably we're a unique um, from other supervisory unions in that we have that model. So, um, it's, come up so twi it's come up twice to me. Yeah. So, so what you just okay. described would be the basic tenets of what the letter is that we would Correct. So, so I would suggest for the purposes for this board, for this evening, for this topic, that um, we ask administration to take our suggestion, finish that letter if it's not finished already. The waiver. The waiver, the waiver request. Okay. Distribute to the U46 members um, between now and September 16th. It looks like we're going to meet on September 16th anyway for um, uh, purposes of board visioning, mm -hmm. we add one additional topic to the meeting that night, which is the um, uh, waiver request review, sure. which will come, which will still give us enough time 
as a U46 board to give direction to the CCSU board members who meet on September 30th because I don't think we have enough in front of us tonight for that and, and I, I think there's value in seeing seeing it on paper and documenting what our what our position is absolutely good, and good I'm, suggestion okay. because it really shows good faith on absolutely. our part right. to explain our specific situation right and I look, I'd use those words in the letter somehow good faith uh, response and request mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. response that we're required to make a good faith effort to comply right regardless of whether we seek a waiver right well if we are seek a waiver we still need to make a good faith effort to comply right 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 Yeah. Well, according to my rich watch, <laughs> we are one minute ahead of schedule here well, for tonight as we move to um, uh, the consent agenda, the consent agenda approving the, uh, including the approval of the warrants, which I know have been routed around, uh, the meeting minutes, uh, which have been included in the org notes, the affirmation of the parent student handbook, the approval of the request for leave of absence, the approval for uh, donation. Do we, is there any need to pull any particular item on the consent agenda? Do, uh, did want to check with Gary. Do you have a copy of all the professional appointments? There were, there was um, one additional one additional one on, that included with one that was part of the board notes. Right. Uh, so, so there's a total of two professional appointments right. for this evening. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that correct? Right. Um, I thought that you had already approved one, and this is the new one. Uh, it was sent to you um, with additional materials when the board agenda was revised. Yeah, it's it's the position style. for uh, Hillary Arthur yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the 0.125 yeah. health teacher. Uh, health teacher. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. 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 Stated. Uh, uh, any any need to pull out any particular item? Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda as listed? So moved by Ryan. Second. Second by Al. All in favor of the consent agenda, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion for the consent to. Consent agenda passed six zero. Next item on uh, agenda items that should be calendared for future board meetings. Uh, I actually I have two. I have two from this evening. Uh, aside from from our normal uh, calendar review work that we would do. The, uh, the motorcycle safety course issue was one that this this board needs to uh, review and address. And there's um, uh, preparations for our vision vision meeting on September 16th to now include a um, uh, open session agenda item for the 
waiver request on me that we just that we just discussed in, in direction for the CCSU reps from the 46. Is there anything else that should be calendared for future board meetings? This is November. This is for November, correct. We talked a while back about uh, graduation requirements. And I thought the teachers were planning to come back somewhere in that time frame. Because that's an important discussion. Uh, I, I don't know. <coughs> I, I don't. I, I do recall the graduation requirements discussion. I don't require if I don't recall if we were going to have what the teacher schedule was coming out of your educational leadership teams were on this particular topic and what the timetable was for that. There's a curriculum committee that was uh, working on proficiency-based graduation requirements, and I can include that information as far as um, their tasks. I'll just see where it is. Mm -hmm. Give us an update. Okay. Mm -hmm. and then, I think those are some of the topics that are great to broadly and widely engage our stakeholders in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I'm sure would happen. But it, it's you know it's one of the roles I think the board can help with in engaging um, the community or business leaders Art as well. well. So, yeah. Um, I think that, and if there's idea about, um, I know that you've mentioned that some of the some of the uh, interests to investigate our grading system may be not necessary because of a change in our a more wholesale change in the grading system. But again, I, I think you know that that can't hurt from pretty broad and open and long discussion with stakeholders. Be a huge shift going from the traditional mm -hmm. kind of approach grading system, either using numbers or letters to proficiency based, which is a which is a natural way to tie in what our grad requirements at the same time. But it's a much smaller shift to move from a grading system that matches ninety eight percent of Vermont to you know the mm -hmm. the large shift might be long term. Mm -hmm and take multiple years, it's a relatively short switch to be more in line. And um, I think there's some solid benefits that could be voiced by scholarship awarders and college admission counselors and others that could say that it would be a great benefit to, to SS students if we change their grading scale. I, I hate to be postponing that in hopes that we can have this huge shift from Carnegie because that one has so many factors outside of our control. But since we've decided our grading system and it's internal, evidenced by we're different than everybody else, then that's something that seems to be um, seriously in our control where a change to proficiency is gonna have to take some time and research with our, you know, the schools that, that our students go to. Which is already yeah. uh -huh. So I guess well, I guess these are the these are the items that that I hear from from the community as as really interested to help the evolution of Essex High in some of these conversations. And I guess I I just really I, I just want to put my interest out there that I don't want to get a presentation of what's been decided mm -hmm. because I think the stakeholders can inform the decisions. I don't think they're in a decision place at all. They're in a place of learning about how proficiency-based requirements work and how they can be constructed. So there's a lot of internal learning um, that's happening now at, um, within this. Well, Rob, you can probably so speak to that better than me about your work with that. Is the intention to, to lead to that work? Or, or can there be some discussion about where we stand right now? Yeah, discussion. Yeah. How, how can we? How can we as a board help? Under how can we help with that? That discussion of where we are. When we have stakeholder meetings, be part of. It. Okay. And using your position as leverage in communication. 
And we're essentially that ultimately set the policy. I don't. Is the grading a policy at all? No, I'm grading requirements. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm particularly interested in the math, the science, mm -hmm. uh, STEM, algebra requirements, because uh, you know they're they're thinking about making these statewide requirements, mm -hmm. and that's why I keep asking, like, well, where are we? Because they could come down and make a decision. They could, and that's a K twelve conversation. Yeah, and that. In the August 8th article that I just gave uh, um, Jack uh, really makes the case that uh, you know, given state of technology and science today, students need to be prepared with higher math skills okay. and uh, they're not part, I don't know where they are now, part of our graduation requirements, but we've heard some feedback that computer applications Computers uh, need to be uh, the students need if they don't know how to use a computer. That's one thing, but to know where the applications are and how to, to leverage applications so that they can be more effective and efficient. Those are critical courses. So if we can do anything in those areas. I, those are the areas I'm interested in. Is where we're going there. There's right time to come court. Math, yeah, and next gen science standards, which were just adopted over the summer. So, math teachers have done a good job aligning algebra one and geometry as a first step, and the science teachers are just barely meeting for the first time to wrap their arms around what 912 is going to look like with the next gen science standards. So, it's going to get to where you want to be, but it's a timely process to realign curriculum. I understand. The next gen science standards were just approved by the state yeah. last month. So it's hard to talk about what proficiency based requirements will look like until teachers right. have an opportunity to understand the standards and the requirements. Okay. That's good. Okay, any other topics that should be mm -hmm. calendar for future board meetings? Mm -hmm. Again, our future board, our next board meeting is in November. I don't have the exact date, but. Uh, we'd have the 40 again, the, the usual. I think at that point in time, we'd have. Three. October 1. Count. Yeah, we know yeah. that. And then I think it would probably, it might be too early, but it would be close to the time that um, enrollment group. Objections would probably more like December. Uh, we could get it depending on the board. I can give you school choice numbers too because we'll have those. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have them. What's what's yeah. right. the system, but actually, who shows up is another right. story. Mm -hmm. okay. like Different application process next year, or is it back to it as far as people coming and applying to open positions? You have a really tight timeline. Yeah. Well, so I think the fact that it'll be, well, it'll be better known by families. That's the one thing. I, I got a call today on the opportunity to apply. You're not building admissions? <laughs> not this year. But I think there was misunderstanding of the timeline. Yeah. Okay. No, it was, it was, we have a meeting in November, and I didn't know if we had one in December or not. Thinking that we didn't have one in December, or we, if we didn't have one in December, it would have been time for the board to provide guidance to administration on budget development. But, you know, I mean, it, we're already we're just yeah. starting this year, but it's you know, it's not too too far in the distant future that we have to start. So, other than your special meeting that you've just identified tonight for September 16th. Your next regular board meeting is October 21st. Okay. So that's the meeting that we're talking about now as right. far as future. October 21st. Future. Jack, are there special board needs for the kind of open house tables, locations? We have not discussed that. Okay. Um, I, um, but I'm willing to entertain that tonight because open house is happening between tonight in our next board meeting, right? I think this past, the past
past year, uh, we did not do any, anything special for, um, and, and I got no feedback, and I don't know if any of our board members did either from the community, so that was a uh, option that was missed by the community by not having board members there. Um, I, I think an approach should be like what we did last year is, is uh, there's no need for a formal table or a presence there. Oh, to be great. Uh, me, me. Again, yeah. nothing more than perhaps because you do an introduction in the auditorium right yeah. before, before, and that that uh, the board members could be recognized and made available, but uh, and made available for discussions. But I don't think there's anything more than that that you require. So I sure. But that's one board member's view. I don't know no, how other board members right. feel about that. I think you're right. Okay. Well, we did have the table. It wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't good. well. Uh, I mean, we didn't did a lot of. Table. Yeah. yeah. Just us. Right. Did we? I forget. Did we have um, name tags last year? Yeah. Uh, I believe you did. We did. I do believe we did. Okay. I was just gonna say we could just that would be make helpful. sure to have a nice sure. name tag. Actually, the CTE agreed today to um, create some really nice name tags for you. So actually, for all boards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any, anything else for um, future future items? A uh, quick, quick question for the board before we uh, go into executive session is uh, the question I, uh, the topic I heard raised earlier tonight is what worked in tonight's meeting and what didn't work in tonight's meeting? <laughs> true. Okay. Any, any quick comments on that? I know this is a throwing uh, new news question at you guys because you didn't have a chance to really ponder this or know that the only, the only item I got caught off guard on was the uh, the career center because it's such an important topic uh, if I had known that was coming I would have certainly asked to be put on the agenda I mean I uh, but I, I had a chance to ask because it was in your notes so I think it can be really we're still in the meeting the conversation stage so right might have been a little bit But that's okay. I mean, yeah. you know, start to get feedback. Even if it's 10 minutes, five minutes for the board, at least everyone, uh, it's on everyone's radar. You get some awareness before the meeting starts. You can even ask a few questions before. So, but that was the one that kind of caught me off guard. And the other one had to do with uh, comparing our scores back to the state. I. You know, Judy, uh, with all of the infrastructure that's now being put in place, fiber throughout the state, I cannot imagine why DOE is not leveraging that technology in the classrooms throughout the state. It, I don't, and when I think about those below state scores, it's like, what a disaster. Are we, what are, we don't. We, you know, why isn't anyone taking ownership for this? But the one suggestion that I had for the maybe your superintendent's meeting would be to push for the leveraging of technology in all schools throughout the month. And maybe even the secondary thought was maybe there needs to be a recommendation to put laptops in every classroom for every child to start using this technology. Just a thought. Okay. Anything else? What worked? What didn't work tonight? <coughs> Hearing none, uh, I want to move into executive session for the purpose of collective bargaining discussion. Okay. RETN, thank you very much. We're, we're done for this evening. And uh, everyone have a good evening.